By now, you already know from the four preceding episodes that you are more likely to get killed or seriously injured by the complications of colonoscopy than by colorectal cancer, while the screenings do absolutely nothing to prevent colon cancer. If anything, they are more likely to hasten it. So, to end the death by colonoscopy series on a constructive note, I will help you to get started with real prevention, not make belief as commonly recommended by the same people who promote colonoscopy screenings. A lot of health conscious individuals surrender themselves to the risk of colon cancer because they falsely believe it may be in their genes. In reality, according to the National Cancer Institute, only 3% of all colorectal cancers are hereditary. This means about 1,500 people in their early 40s may die each year from truly bad genes, about the same as the total number of Americans killed or injured by colonoscopy screenings in just one week. So if any of your close relatives past 50 have been affected by polyps or cancer, it simply means that you may be affected by the same external risk factors as that person. These risks are called endemic, dependent on your habitat, and by no means are genetic. In other words, if your brother eventually becomes stone deaf because the two of you blasted your iPods while growing up, you may end up deaf too, but this has nothing to do with anyone's genes. Nevertheless, that almost non-existent genetic connection is skillfully exploited by the promoters of colorectal cancer screenings to scare people into frequent tests. So don't become an easy mark for this scam. Colorectal cancer is no more in your genes than indigestion or hemorrhoids are. And even if it is, you need a simple blood test to check it out, not a colonoscopy. Also, this means that the remaining 97% of colorectal cancers are mainly self-inflicted, just like lung or skin cancers are. If you take away the external causes of any of these cancers, you aren't likely to get one either. Still, a lot of people give up on prevention altogether simply because most of the preventative advice is unrealistic, unattainable, conflicting, or just downright stupid. This unfortunately is also the case with colorectal cancer prevention, which is based around more screenings, more fiber, more water, and less fat. All of the factors that will actually increase your risk of bowel disorders and colorectal cancer. So let's avoid this trap and follow the 80-20 rule. This rule means that 20% of any effort delivers you 80% of all results. In this case, our 80% goal concerns inflammation of the mucosal membrane, the inside layer of the bowel wall, and anything that may cause it. It is a well-established fact that bowel inflammation is behind the majority of polyps and lesions that eventually turn into cancerous tumors. As I already mentioned in the previous episode, when bowel inflammation affects the entire colon, the risk of colorectal cancer, according to the National Institute of Health, increases as much as 32 times the normal rate. That's right, 3,000 to 100%. For this reason alone, a lifelong prevention of bowel inflammation, localized, partial or total, will deliver you that most protection from colorectal cancer. Since my recommendations are based on preventing and reversing bowel disorders, that cause inflammation, besides escaping cancer, you will also get rid of flatulence, irregularity, constipation, diarrhea, abdominal bloating, irritable bowel syndrome, abdominal cramps, and all other equally nasty disorders that arise from them. Not a bad proposition, actually. This opportunity alone makes the prevention of inflammation worthwhile, regardless of your age or colon cancer risk, because, as wise old doctors used to say, your health begins and ends in the gut. To help you along, I've created a detailed colorectal cancer prevention guide. It describes primary causes of bowel inflammation that precede colon cancer. These causes are rarely, if ever, discussed by mainstream doctors or why it is important to eliminate them and how to accomplish it. Why is that? I don't know. So please ask them, not me. If you can't get a satisfactory answer, refer them to my site. All of my recommendations are thoroughly referenced by up-to-date research from blue chip sources, so doctors should find themselves right at home. My guide involves seven concurrent steps. The steps address primary causes of bowel inflammation and related to risk factors that contribute to oncogenesis of most polyps, 
lesions, and tumors. Step 1 goes to the core of colon function, storage and removal of human waste. Any breakdown in this process causes abnormal stools and leads to chronic bowel disorders. Since very few people actually know what normal stools are, this step explains what they are and how to normalize them. Dietary fiber happens to be the primary cause of abnormal stools. Its side effects range from severe diarrhea to colon obstruction. For this reason, step number two explains how to reduce your dependence on fiber without experiencing constipation, a common side effect of fiber withdrawal. The connection between fiber fermentation and cancer is so obvious that even the arch-conservative Merck Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy points out its role. Carcinogens may be ingested in the diet, but are more likely produced by bacterial action on dietary substances. Well, fiber happens to be the only dietary substance that reaches the colon undigested and gets fermented by bacteria. Alas, instead of eliminating fiber, Merck recommends to kill bacteria with antibiotics. What else would you expect from this charter member of Big Pharma? That bacteria bring us to step number three, restoring colon ecosystem that was damaged by antibiotics. It is an essential step because bacteria prevent constipation, protect the colon from pathogens, make essential vitamins, and govern primary immunity, which in turn suppresses the proliferation of numerous cancer-causing factors. The moment you get rid of fiber and restore your colon ecology, the next challenge is staying regular. Missing even one bowel movement hardens stools and makes the next defecation more difficult or downright impossible because so many adults past 40 already suffer from colorectal nerve damage and their colons no longer function properly. Unfortunately, the moment you get irregular, there is a strong tendency to return right back to fiber dependence, large stools, and antibiotics. After becoming regular, our next goal is good immunity. This is what protects you from random cell mutations, environmental risks, and pre-existing problems. Step 5 explains the role of immunity in cancer prevention and what needs to be done to keep it in top-notch shape. Still, even the best immunity in the world can be easily overrun by too many external risk factors, or triggers as I call them. The major ones are medications, wrong foods, carcinogenic food additives, heavy metals, and many, many others. To stay cancer-free, you should anticipate and eliminate as many of these triggers as possible. Therefore, step six, avoid common cancer triggers, explains which ones, why, and how. Finally, step seven deals with slowing down physiological aging. As you know, colorectal cancer affects people past 50 the most. This is happening because all of the preceding problems, colon deformation, nerve damage, fiber dependence, and inflammatory bowel disease gradually overpower our immunity as we age. Obviously, you can't unwind your chronological years. You can, however, reduce and somewhat reverse your rate of physiological aging and keep age onset cancers at bay for much, much longer. I hope you also realize that all of the seven steps will protect you from other major cancers such as breast cancer, ovarian, prostate, and so on. The organs and location may differ, but the core causes, triggers, and protective mechanisms are pretty much the same. Well, at this point, the ball is in your court, so study the colorectal cancer prevention guide as if your life depends on it, follow its common sense guidelines, and enjoy a healthy gut for as long as humanly possible. In turn, I wish you a ton of good luck, lots of health, and cancer-free future. And never forget, the harder you work, the luckier you get.